Hey, Walter Sorrels back with more tips for the knife maker. Today, making a Japanese hatchet ish sort of thing. So when you go from one culture to another, you often find that the more things change, the more things stay the same. But sometimes not. Take the hatchet, or in Japanese, the nada. Today we'll be making a small Japanese pruning tool, it's basically a hatchet, that has a whole different design philosophy from its European cousin. Sort of think of it as halfway between a hatchet and a machete. So let's get started and we'll see how it comes out. We'll forge weld an ultra hard high carbon steel to a soft steel back. Many Japanese tools are made this way. In this case, we'll cut off a chunk of this big piece of mild steel, which isn't capable of being hardened, and then forge weld a piece of 1086M vanadium steel to it. The nada will only be sharpened on one side, so the 1086M will be forge welded only to one side of the block of mild steel. I'll clean and flatten the sides that will be mating together on the grinder, removing all mill scale. Scale will not weld, so it's gotta go. After tack welding the pieces together and then welding on a handle, I'll fire up the forge to around 2400 degrees Fahrenheit, a temperature hot enough to make steel stick to steel. Once the billet started to show some color, I'll drizzle a little borax on it. This will liquefy and then get sucked into the gap between the pieces through capillary action. The borax is a flux, meaning that it dissolves any oxides that form on the steel so that they're flushed out when the steel is forced together. Once the billet reaches welding heat, I'll squeeze it in my hydraulic forge press, causing the two pieces of steel to weld together. Notice that I'm wearing brazing glasses to shield against the ultraviolet light produced by the forge. Spend enough time looking into the forge and you'll actually get sunburn from the light. You definitely don't want that on your eyes all the time. I'm now drawing out the steel. This nada will be quite thick, over a quarter of an inch. I'll use both a drawing die and a flatting die to get it where I want it to be. After it's drawn out, I'll let it cool, then cut the ends off and do a little grinding to make sure the welds are good. Perfect. The weld is almost invisible, which is just what you want. If you see a conspicuous line where the two pieces of steel join together, your weld has probably failed. Then it's back to the forge to form the tang. I goofed and forgot to turn the camera on for the first heat here, but the idea is that you want to cant the steel down so the edge of the anvil bites into the steel where the tang will begin. Now I want the hammer to hit on the flat of the spine, however, because I want to drive the tang up towards the top of the blade. Now I'll draw it out a little, tapering it slightly. Also forge in the single bevel which runs down one side of the blade. Unlike western hatchets and knives, this is an asymmetrical blade with only one bevel. In retrospect, I probably should have just ground the bevel in for reasons I'll explain later, but it's sort of more fun to forge them. Thank you. 
Now I'll normalize the blade, heating it to about 1600 degrees three times. This decreases the grain size of the steel and reduces forging stresses. Then it's on to the grinder. I want this blade to have a really rustic look, so I'm not going to be grinding the whole thing to bare steel and perfectly flat surfaces. Hey guys, let me take a minute to brag on today's sponsor, Grizzly Industrial. If you don't know them, you should. Grizzly is a supplier of just a huge range of woodworking and metalworking tools. In fact, you'll see me using a bunch of Grizzly tools in this video, but I own lots more stuff than you'll see here. I've got a Grizzly wood lathe, a metal lathe, a disc grinder, a buffer, a bunch of other stuff. And all of them were bought over the years with my own cash money, by the way, long before they ever sponsored any of my videos. Why do I own so many Grizzly tools? Look, every time I was shopping for a tool, I found it was pretty hard to beat them for that combination of value and quality that all of us who run small shops are chasing after. If you want to find out more about them, they got a great channel on YouTube. It's got tons of information about various tools that they sell, uh, tips, tricks, maintenance, setup, buyer's guides, just all kinds of interesting information. Links in the description so you can jump over and subscribe to the Grizzly channel. And of course, when you want to buy Grizzly tools, grizzly.com. But I will flatten the back enough to remove most of the scale, not all of it, but most of it, and then grind in the bevels. Obviously, the section along the edge has to be perfectly clean, but the rest of it, it doesn't really matter. As I alluded earlier, I would have done better to skip forging the bevels. The reason for this is that it compresses the edge steel so that the hardened part of the steel is quite thin on the edge. There's not really a functional problem with that for this particular geometry. As thick as this blade is and as steep as the grind is, the edge is very well supported. It just means that you have to do a little bit more grinding to reach that hardenable steel when you're shaping it on the grinder. Now it's time to quench the blade, hardening the edge steel. I'll heat the blade in my forge to about 1500 degrees Fahrenheit, then plunge it into water for about a second, followed by a full immersion in an engineered quenching oil. The reason for doing it in two stages like this is that the steel is so thick and the high carbon steel requires such a rapid quench that even a fast quenching oil like I'm using here might not fully harden the edge steel. Quenching it in water alone, however, is asking for the blade to crack, so I'm kind of splitting the difference. After cleaning it up a little on the grinder, it's time to turn to the handle. I'll be making my handle out of cocobolo, an oily tropical wood. Some people experience severe irritation of the skin or lungs when using cocobolo, so if you should use cocobolo for this or any other project for that matter, be careful. I'll be using a respirator, though it doesn't bother me particularly badly. Better safe than sorry. I'll cut a blank on the bandsaw, then slice that in half. Next, it's over to the disc grinder to flatten the pieces. I want them to mate perfectly, so they need to be dead flat. Now I'll be cutting a channel out of the center to fit the tang of the blade. This is a technique taken from Japanese sword making. I'm using a Japanese style saya chisel, that is a scabbard chisel, which has a bent handle specifically so that you can dig out channels like this and still have clearance for your fingers. Cocobolo is a splintery hard wood that really doesn't like chisels, but we get there eventually. I want a nice tight fit, but not so tight that I can't get the tang of the nada into the handle after glue up. The next step will be to epoxy the two halves together. After putting the glue on there and clamping it up, I kept the blade inside to make sure that the two pieces don't creep. If the halves move out of alignment while the glue is still fluid, you'll never get the handle in again.
Now I'll start shaping the handle on my belt grinder. While they're still flat and easy to keep oriented, I'll drill holes for the cross pins that will hold the blade in the handle. Then it's back to the grinder to start shaping them to their final rounded shape. I'll begin by grinding facets fairly aggressively on my flat platen working my way step by step toward a more rounded profile. I'm using a 60 grit belt to rough everything out. Eventually I'll turn to a slack belt attachment which makes it easier to blend everything smooth as well as to work effectively on the inside curve of the handle. Now I'll turn to a 220 grit J-weight belt. J-weight belts are extremely flexible unlike the X-weights that I've been using earlier and as a result they're less prone to hacking big old divots out of the handle with the edges of the belt. There's only one step left which is to make a ferrule which in turn keeps the stresses on the handle and blade junction from ripping the handle apart when you're chopping things. Now you could do this with plumbing pipe or seamless tube, a lot of easier ways of doing it, but in this case I'll actually turn the part on my lathe and give it a little more of a custom look. I'm starting with a piece of one and an eighth inch round brass. I'll face it. Then true up the OD which is already about the right size for this project. Then I'll run through a sequence of drills to open up the ID, finishing up with a boring bar. After a little polishing, I'll part it off and it's ready to go. Now I'll cut a seat for the ferrule on the handle. The ferrule needs to fit quite tightly, so you don't want to overshoot and end up with a bunch of slop in the fit. This means painstakingly try fitting. Once you're almost there, resist the temptation to tinker and get that last thing dead perfect. You'll actually want to whack this into place so it's good and tight. And that means it's got to be just a hair oversized when you quit chiseling. So next it's time for final assembly. For those of you who watched my recent video about making a lap in Lyuku, I talked about when it's handy to use slow curing epoxy. This is one of those instances, a fairly complicated handle assembly. I'll be putting the tang into the handle, then tapping home the ferrule, and then seating the cross pins. Ferrules, as I said, should be quite tightly fit, and sometimes the epoxy causes the wood to swell a little bit, 
and that can make it so you really have to do a lot of monkeying around to get it seated. Then you've got the cross pins to do too, and you really don't want your five minute epoxy hardening up on you in the middle of this, so having some extra working time is really handy. Once it's cured, I'll trim and grind the cross pins. Then I'll finish up by hand sanding the handle. All that's left is final sharpening and the knot is ready to start trimming, limbing, and bushwhacking. The nice thing about the nada, because it combines the qualities of a hatchet and a knife, is that it can be used for relatively fine work, but it still has the oomph to chop pretty sizable vegetation. I hope you learned something from this project. I know I did. You know, sometimes there are videos where I know all the parameters like the back of my hand, and then sometimes you know, I do a project really more to teach myself something new than anything else. And this was one of those projects. You know, I'm a big believer that unless you keep challenging yourself, any hobby or craft or pursuit, whatever it might be, professional or not, it just gets stale and it turns into a boring job. And who wants that? So the whole reason we go into the garage to do this stuff in the first place is because other things in our life are kind of stale or boring, right? So you only got one life, keep it fresh. Thanks for watching guys. If you feel like you got something out of this video, don't forget to subscribe. Also, click on the link to Patreon for a great way to give back to the channel. Plus, check me out on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Links in the description. If you want something sharp and pointy, maybe a gift for yourself or one of the cooler people in your life, check out my Tactics Armory website and pick up one of our tactical or outdoor knives. And finally, if you want to learn to make hamons or Japanese swords, check out waltersorrelsblades.com where you can find videos about how I make hamons as well as forging, mounting, polishing, and fittings for Japanese swords. Thanks and see you soon!